Hey, welcome to the Interesting Podcast with Jedi Brian number three. I finally figured out how to record these intros. So apparently, um, I record this thing on the H4 Zoom, H4N, and I kept turning the volume up, wondering why it was so quiet for the intros, and then come to find out, I was turning up the volume for the headphones, not for the recording. So yeah, thanks for tuning in. We're uh, three episodes in and going strong, I think. This one was actually recorded back at Supercon. Uh, it's with Thinkalike Productions. Now, Thinkalike Productions is a uh, a company headed by uh, Ruben and Bethany Romero and uh, their friend Roger Cabrera. All really, really great people. Um, we met at, I believe, Tampa Bay Comic-Con in 2014 or something like that. They've been some of my biggest supporters as far as the Cabbage Merchant goes and pretty much anything that I cosplay. Um, but they're way cool people, and they... Um, created this comic. It's actually the only comic that I that I s- keep up with and I still read called The Agency. And in this, if you're looking to get into comics, they pretty much lay out a step-by-step of what it needs, what you need to do to make your own comic. Um, they have diamond distribution, which means they're, they're sold in comic stores and everything, and they're uh, artists that are paving the way, which is fantastic. I, it's, it's such an honor to know these people, and I think you're really going to enjoy this. Also, a huge, 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 huge shout out to uh, Electroc Works. I believe that's how you pronounce it. On uh, Fiverr.com. Uh, this guy is um, hes from Italy. His name is uh, Leandro. Thanks to him, I have a theme song for this podcast. And I am so happy with it. It's so perfect and different. And that, that's what I was going for. So here it is. Um, without further ado, the interesting podcast with Jedi Brian number three with Think Alike Productions. All right, we're recording. I guess. And that's how we're going to do it. We're just going to... That's exactly how we're going to do it. We're recording. Yep, we're recording. All right. Okay, well, I am here with the creator of the Agency comic series. We have... You guys introduce yourself. My name is Ruben Romero. Bethany Romero. And Roger Cabrera. And I'm actually a huge fan of these guys and have been for quite a bit. And... um, I actually wanted to talk to you guys about how you started it at first, because I know a lot of people, specifically in this sort of circuit, want to make their own comic, but they don't know how. So how did you guys start? Where, where did the idea come from? How did you get into it? Um, basically, it, it started because me and Roger were, we had entered a screenplay writing contest, nice. and we kind of got the writing bug from there. And uh, I was reading The Walking Dead, and he came to me and he was like, "Why don't we? Why don't we write a comic book? I mean, we're writing screenplays that we can't shoot, like we can't make the movie. So why don't we see some? You know, why don't we do something that we can watch come to life?" And uh, and I said, "Okay, well, what are we going to write about?" And um, he approached me with the idea of mages, and I had never heard the term. Okay. So he explained to me what that was, and then that got the gears turning, and we started to talk about if magic really existed, how would our government, how would the world respond? Um, uh, and then okay. we told uh, Bethany uh, the idea, and she, you know, she thought up of uh, a lot of story elements and brought in uh, some of the things that will be introduced later on in the series. Right. Uh, and then, you know, we've been working since then. So the characters you just figured out as you went. What made you want to do like an agency specifically? I think it was just the the, the idea was that it came from what, how would our world, you know, how would our, our like if the real world. In most magic stories, magic is usually taboo. Everybody, right. n- not everybody knows that magic exists. So kind of like in Harry Potter, like there's this whole other side of the world uh, where, okay. like where magic is real to them. But muggles or people that aren't magically savvy don't know that it exists. So I, I thought, what if the world uh. knew magic existed? What if people were using magic? What if like an Al-Qaeda or an ISIS were able to use and wield magic? How would our government respond? And I thought 
obviously with a three-letter, you know, clandestine organization. Right. So that's how the IAM was born, and um, and it was really it was it was more about like trying to organize it and and, and ground it in reality as opposed to make it like yeah, make it new, make right. it you know less like a superhero story, you know. That's cool. That's cool. Um, how did you come up with the characters? Because I, I well actually first let's talk about what the agency is. So the agency um, is a comic book. It's essentially Harry Potter meets Mission Impossible. So uh, the IAM is the International Agency of Magic, and it's been created to stop, like he said, magical terrorists from committing magical crimes all over the globe. And it's a magical policing agency for the government, similar right. to the FBI, CIA. And uh, the main character in the story, Riley Dean, is a 15-year-old orphan who discovers in this first series that he's got these abilities he never knew he had and he's attempting to stop a robbery and he inadvertently causes a magical explosion. That's what gets him on the radar of the agents and he's detained and brought back to headquarters where the training of the young mage begins. But, you know, similar to every gov government agency, there's a lot of corruption and sure. deceit going on behind the scenes and there's no coincidence why Riley's been brought in. So a lot of our uh, the other main characters, which are the agents of the IAM, um, we created, you know, Roger had, and, Ro and Ruben had a lot to do with that. Roger created his favorites, which are Remo and Damien. Mm -hmm. And um, Damien is, I, want, I wouldn't say like a spy character, but he is, you know, a watcher. And he's also a shapeshifter, so he can become a, a crow in the story. So he can watch Riley and the other agents and what they're doing and report them back to the villain who I don't want to reveal too much about for the readers who haven't read the book. I want to, you know, give you the opportunity to find out who the villain is. Sure. But the other agents, uh, you know, Victoria, Remo, Paul, and um, Ao were all created by, by us, you know, and just brainstorming different characters and what their abilities were. I think it was important to come up with unique, new twists on things that we thought were awesome and not just do the same thing that's been done over and over again. So they are very different from each other. Right, absolutely. Um, Roger, yes. Remo. Remo, how did that come about? Because you said Remo and Damien, they sound Remo, like favorites. I, I really wanted to create a character that was a badass. All right, that's fair. Yeah, that's about it. And the yeah. glasses. The glasses. I thought I, we had a Skype with the artist and I said, he has to have my glasses. <laughs> Other than that, I don't care. This one's yours. <laughs> yeah. Damien uh, Silas, Bethany's son, he had a book, um, Bernicula versus Edgar Allan Crow. <laughs> and I saw it and I was like, why don't we have a spy mage that could shape shift into a crow? That's fair. That's fair. And then Ruben was like, Damien. He has to be Damien. I was like, all <laughs> right. <laughs> and how long did it take you guys to put together a comic? Because it's a lot of work. It's story, it's colors, it's words, it's all that. From the time um, you're like, I'm gonna I make would, a comic. I would say from it's it's been four years in the making. It's been yeah. four years in the making. Um, holding the agency issue one that we premiered last year here at Florida SuperCon oh, okay. um, was actually four. You know, it was about it was about four years in the making. It it took a while. We we started out with uh, with another artist and um, and we created uh, two full issues with him, and we pitched the image. Uh, Image Comics and Image was like, look, you know, the story's good, but the art, eh, it's lacking in certain areas. Um, so we went back to the drawing board, so to speak, no pun intended. And um, and we met Eric Coda and we instantly had like this kinship from from the minute that we met via Skype. Uh, he, he got it. He knew what we wanted to do. Uh, and uh, and yeah, I mean, it's just it's, it's been a process. I, I would recommend anybody who's doing this to know that it's it's going to take a while. It's not something that just happens overnight. What advice would you give to someone who is thinking about doing their own comic? Uh, firstly, I would say to never give up and also to really study the person that you want drawing this idea. If you're not the artist yourself and you're outsourcing an artist on like a deviantart.com, which is where we met a lot of our artists or Instagram and social media, they have a lot of... Um, you know, groups and things where a lot of great artists who are not working for the great like Marvel and DC are available to the general public, you know, for a price, of course, for a page rate. Of course. <laughs> um, you, can, you can find those artists and ask them to work with you like we were able to do. So if you're a writer with an idea, you want to make sure you have a great idea that hasn't been done before. To Everything's been done at least one sure. way or another, but make it original in some way. 
um, create like an elevator pitch for it that you can easily sell to an audience and see if that gets a great reception. Our tagline, Harry Potter meets Mission Impossible, we turn heads at every convention oh, yeah. with that one identifiable line that makes people say, wow, that sounds interesting. Um, and then lastly, when you put everything together, make sure that with a do a couple of pages first. Always do a test page with somebody before you jump into this 28-page project for a full issue and say, right. like we did, I have two issues that I can't do anything with and I have to start all over again. You don't want to waste your money, so you want to make sure you do max eight pages for a pitch and send it out to some publishers or even other independent creators who can give you their honest feedback and tell you it's not that great or it could use some work before you continue doing that. And then, like I said, never give up because you can. <laughs> he said it, take, it takes four years to make something and it did, but we never gave up and now four years later we're able to sit down with something we truly love and appreciate and we get all the time positive feedback so I think that yeah never give up that's my advice <laughs> now what is uh, what was the hardest part of getting to where you are right now besides the constant like I want to give up and I want to give up but what was the biggest hurdle well, the obvious hurdle is the money sure to get sure. everything put together right but other than that is to keep interest oh yeah because sometimes okay. you lose the interest in what you're doing even if it's yours and you love it sometimes right. you're like I don't really feel like writing today, so you got to kick yourself in the ass to right. to get up and write. Gotcha. And dealing with the no. Right. But Dr. Seuss got 27 no's, and now right. Dr. Seuss is who he is. Because so you don't want to be too J.K. Precious. Rowling and everybody else that's right, any yeah. good at anything. Absolutely. Yeah, you don't want to be too precious about your idea to think. You're exactly. Like, you have to be able to take criticism. Yeah. I'm sure. We have a, we have a little saying, I think, like that not everybody likes chocolate. Right. So... <laughs> You know, you have to, you, you can't be so in love with your own idea that you can't see past it. Sure. Um, there's going to be people there, there's going to be people in your life that even if you're holding a Star Wars. Yeah. Right. You know, even people, you know, even studios told George Lucas, no, you're crazy. This isn't going to work. True. And now look where Star Wars is. Well, like Jurassic World. Yeah, there's people <laughs> who didn't, you know, didn't like Jurassic World and I, I loved it. Um, right. But uh, again, it's just, a, it's really about about believing in yourself, believing in what you're doing, and being able to take that positive criticism and, and turn it into, and the negative uh, criti criticism, and turn that into steam, into fuel, to, to keep moving forward. Now, what was something you did not expect? When you're like, we're gonna make a comic, it's gonna be great, we're gonna make a story. What's like, the side swipe, like, well, I didn't see this coming, besides obviously the price. I mean, For people to like it. <laughs> oh yeah? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, you know, it, it was interesting because I, I knew that, I knew that we had a good idea. You sure. know, I, I, I think that magic and espionage, those are two great genres and putting them together, I think it w was a brilliant idea on our on our part, you know. Right. Um, and then there's things that you can compare that to, you know, people are always like, oh, like the Dresden Files and stuff like that. But we've separated ourselves from from those kind of books with with kind of like the story elements and the things that we do. Um, but, yeah, I think the biggest surprise was that people really enjoy it the way that they do. I mean, we have people who reach out to us via email and they're like, we want more, like give us right. more and, and and people becoming fans and um, and the general reception of just like the, the 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 convention circuit of the the people that are coming in here and and being like wow you guys really did this like this is amazing like we right. love it it's great artwork and and just hearing all that positivity i didn't really expect it i really didn't like i thought it was going to be more like you know <laughs> hit or miss you know and like far and in between and it's just been it's been i would say 97 percent positive right you know with that small percentage of it being negative so all right, uh, Roger, you said you saw it coming. What didn't you see coming? What was, your, what was your biggest, like, whoa, what? When you're trying to make a comic that you were not prepared for? Everything that goes into it. Yeah, the like colorist, the, amount the of letterist, work. <laughs> the, oh, I really don't like this. We should change this, but it's not yours, but okay. Right. Because everybody has an opinion. Sure. So he's like, but I don't like this. Can we do this? And you sit there and you're like, I made this. Right. You did it. <laughs> Why you should I you just do don't it? get it. Yeah. <laughs> but gotcha. everything else. That makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. Because I did, uh, when I want to do certain costumes, like I was like, oh, that'd be really great. And then I start out, I was like, what have I done? <laughs> this is so much more work. Yeah. First, I have to learn how to do that to be able to do it. And how about you, Bethany? Um, I know we touched on the price, so I, I don't want to use that. But I would <laughs> just have to say that 
you know, the biggest surprise for me is the amount of effort it took. And like you were just saying about your costume, when you want to make something for cosplay and you just, you're so ambitious in the beginning and that staying factor with, with something and saying, I don't want to give up or I don't want to, you know, make something subpar. I think that for us who started off as screenwriters and said, oh, it's easy to write a script for us. I know that writing is hard, but for us, it was natural right. to put the first issue at least together was a breeze because we were so passionate about it. But seeing it come to fruition, I did not expect it to take that level of effort into panel work and scenes and saying, okay, now you're, you're legitimately a director of a movie when you make a comic book. It's oh, not right. just, you're not a writer anymore. You're saying they're going to come in through, you know, the crows are going to shape into this creature and they're going to land on this ledge and then he's going to jump into the sky and right. he's going to slap him out of the way. And it's so much more action-based and visual that for me who started off, my I, they write screen um, screenplays when they started, but I was like a novelist. I wanted to write love stories and all that kind of corny, uh, you know, okay. crap. And, and not that it's bad and I'm not knocking novelists <laughs> but I just started in such a different genre that for me I never pictured visually how to tell a story so right. that was a huge hurdle to jump but I didn't expect it to be so the thought process behind it so strenuous and, and lengthy but I think overall I cannot say anything negative about it even with all of the bad that we've been through it's just been so wonderful and rewarding it really has right and you guys do the con circuit. You go to a lot of cons with the agency, Think Alike, and all this. We do. We obviously uh, try to attend all the major ones in Florida. It is our home state. Um, you know, we're currently in Florida Supercon, which is our hometown of Miami. And uh, it was our first convention where we debuted issue one. Oh, cool. And we've done, you know, Tampa Bay, Megacon, uh, PalmCon, and we've done all Fanboy Expo. We've done all of those throughout Florida. We also go to New York City Comic Con. We went last year. We're going again this year, cool. which we love. It's great. We love New York. And we did uh, New Orleans Wizard World. And we're trying to expand our audience outside of Florida, New York, and the East Coast and are trying our very, very best to get to the West Coast for an Emerald City or sure. obviously the, big, the dream, the Mecca the of San Diego. San Diego. You know, so we do travel the con circuit. We understand the mega importance it is to connect with your fans Absolutely. face to face and say you can walk into a comic book store and see the agency and the, the cover is catchy and it sells itself but there's nothing like convincing somebody you just met in a sea of other comic books why your project is a cut above the rest and only right. the creator can speak so passionately true true absolutely um Totally forgot what I was going to say because I was like, man, that comic book is really good. I was thank thinking you. about the cover and I was like, that cover is really cool. Yeah, thank you. We love it. That's our, I mean, it's our fir it's our baby, that first cover, that first issue. We put our blood, sweat, and tears into it. It, it took a while. <laughs> yeah, Roger put blood, blood, sweat, and beers, but all together it was a collective effort and we're very proud of that cover. We got a lot of flack on the cost and the outfit because Riley's not dressed up or in a superhero costume, but we feel like, oh, you know no. what? Regular people, which he he starts off as, uh, can be superheroes as well. So true, true. Again, it's not a, it's not a. Yeah, it's Green true. Lantern does have a hoodie now, and we yeah. get a lot of flack for Riley's hoodie. But, but again, I mean, he's not he's not a superhero, and and um, he's just a magically powered you know teenager who's who gets thrust into this whole situation. So I mean, it was very important for us, for at least for me, um, was to ground it in reality, right, and, and really right. put it in you know make you believe that this that, that this can exist sure yeah, yeah. I, I liked it a lot my i mean my favorite character is remo for sure right. but one of my favorite things about the comic as as a whole is the villains right i loved that you went egyptian i don't know why it just seemed very marvel to me i like that like their masks that people are wearing right. it's not like this giant like bird god showed up it's like no it's a dude that's like into it there's a person there yeah. that's a super bad guy. Oh, yeah. I, I love that. Well, fun fact, that that actually was inspired by an episode of Face Off. Oh, yeah? Uh, that makeup show. Right, right. Um, and they were doing, like, Egyptian uh, crossbreeds or, like, Egyptian demons or something like that. And uh, and I told I told, uh, I told told Roger, I was like, what if, what if, like, our first terrorist cell fancied themselves, like, 
the second coming of these Egyptian gods, you know? Right. And he was like, that's pretty fucking badass. Uh, and I was, yeah, it's I great. Was like, I was like, yeah, let's do it. And uh, and that's that's where the Horus were born. I did some research and, and found out that the Horus were an actual, was an actual group in Egypt. Oh, cool. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we just went from there and we started to pick the gods and say, okay, well, Ra, Anubis, you know, you have to have the two, the big two. And then uh, Amit and Amut, we, we really dug deep because we just didn't we we wanted to be we wanted to make them interesting and we wanted to make them menacing uh and we wanted to ground them again in reality sure. so we wanted to make sure that these gods or or, or deities that these egyptians were wor worshiping at the time they're kind of like dark and sinister right. and that they had some like kind of like evil background you know for sure so. and there's something about having a bunch of bad guys around a table they just right. mean business I oh don't yeah know why. oh yeah like they've collected and they sit down to talk about their problems about they're their, organized yeah yeah <laughs> no they're definitely organized <laughs> Um, so, you've written the agency. Right. You've got a couple other comics here. Right. How are they correlated to you? Um, they are under the Think Alike banner. Okay. So we went out and we started to look for other hungry, creative, independent creators, uh, writers who were doing what we were doing a year ago, putting their comic books together, going to cons, um, trying to sell them out of the trunk of their cars, wherever, wherever right. anybody would listen. Um, and we ran, into, uh, we ran into a group called Dark Side Global, who had a book called Max Hunter. And um, we immediately gravitated towards each other. We, were, we became instant friends. And um, the minute that, that Think Alike kind of cemented itself and, 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 got, you know, and found its, its feet uh, and hit the ground running, we said, okay, you guys are, are next. Um, and then we, yeah, I met Bob Sally who is the writer creator for a book called Salvagers okay. uh, via Facebook. And he was doing his thing on social media and just everywhere. And uh, he sent me a, a PDF version of issue one and I immediately fell in love with it. I mean, it's <laughs> one of those books where, and I'm not just saying it just because he's on Think Alike. I mean, it's really one of those books that if you read it, you want the next one almost immediately. Right. Um, and I was lucky enough to be to the point where he was like, hey, you know what? I trust you. I love what Think Alike is doing, I, you know, and, and I want to hand you my baby, so to speak, and uh, and be part of the team. And how can I do that? Uh, and uh, and then the same thing with Kevin Mills, who's got a book called Sakuro coming out later in the fall. Um, I was I was personally hired to uh, adapt a screenplay called Pray for Angels, which cool. is a retelling, uh, reimagining of the Jack the Ripper story. Oh, okay. uh, it's a movie that's probably going to start shooting next May out in Paris. Uh, that was written by Christian Fraga and uh, Cirque Productions. And they, the, one of the executive producers on the movie, Benjamin Sharbit, who also sits on the Think Alike board, hired me to adapt the screenplay into a five-issue miniseries. Wow, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. So the uh, Think Alike is you as well? Yeah, Think Alike is, is us. It's, it's me, my wife, Roger. Um, his wife, Roger? No. His wife, Roger? No, uh -huh. Roger's I should have put a comma in that, right? Or a pause. <laughs> um <laughs> The importance of commas, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, my wife Bethany and Roger, uh, we are uh, we are Think Alike Productions along with Benjamin Sharbit. He's our cool. our so to speak our executive producer. That's really cool though. So uh, you've got a comic. You're currently still writing. You've got what five issues of online. the agency, okay, right? You've got two physical, and are you going to continue? You're continuing with the yeah, agency. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. Volume two is going to be called the Agency Unseen. Okay. So <clears throat> I don't want to spoil too much, but it'll continue the Riley story. Okay. Um, and then we're going to del delve into a little bit of a, of a backstory on, uh, on Victoria. Cool. Which people seem to want to know more about because uh, she's not I only our leader, but she's a hot brunette. Yeah. So they want to know more about her. She can make weapons. And there's so much more to women than just their looks. And Victoria is like, <laughs> not only is she hot, but she's the female lead of the story. And she's wonderful, intelligent, <laughs> witty. So, in addition to her being a hot brunette, you know, girl power. Sure. And she can create an axe with her mind. Yeah. she's. <laughs> I mean, she's a conjurer. So, arguably, she's got the best power. I know that Remo is amazing <laughs> with his speed and his, you know, the center magic. The cool thing about the mages are that they all have different powers. Right. And, you know, Paul's got his staff, so he can use that to wield magic. Ao, I think, is the personal personally the coolest he's mage cool. because he he's a healer so he can store a w if he you know heals your broken arm he can store that wound and like transfer it to another person that he's fighting with so i just think that that is such a unique twist on a healing power you know i i love ale and he's like a big uh so he's a teddy bear you know he's <laughs> 
very yeah. nice and sweet. I love him. But Victoria, I think, is arguably the coolest mage because she is the most ambitious of all of them. She doesn't. She's right. very level-headed, has her eye on the prize. And if you read the agency, you'll know always has a trick up her sleeve. Seems like she has no idea what's really going on behind the scenes, but nobody knows better than Tori what's going to happen next or what she plans to right. do about it. So I just love her. She's very in charge. She is very in charge. I, I like I like the staff deal. That's so cool. That it's like passed down and only members of that bloodline can yeah. activate it. That's cool. Yeah, Paul was you know he's our comedy relief you know and <laughs> and, and I felt like <laughs> like yeah not not only are you gonna have a, a big mouth but um but I also want people to to kind of like want to know more about your history and your family and uh, and the, and we do that through the staff because immediately once you find out that the staff is being passed down you're like oh well who else has had it right where did it come from sure what happens if paul falls you know if paul yeah. were to pass away, who, who gets it next can a cousin take it yeah can a, <laughs> can a, can a third cousin have it yeah. maybe um but yeah no i mean you know we've got you know like i said the agency on scene will be out uh first issue will be out early next year oh, hopefully it's so far um, away <laughs> and and yeah we're gonna get to delve into like the backstories of all of our agents a little bit more and continue to move riley forward yeah i'm really excited about that I like them a lot. I, just, I love the characters. It's so cool. I always like the idea of a team. Right. Each person brings something else to the table. Right. And it was really cool. Yeah. Um, so you're adapting stuff for a series. So you're also writing stuff outside of comics. Yeah. What is with this sort of like the end game? Do you have like a big picture? Like you'd like it to be sold in all the stores. You like it online. I, I mean, or just you know, we to people. really, really, we just want the world to be able to experience our stories. Cool. Um, we we want to continue putting out comic books. I want to continue writing. I, I have a little dream, you know, about writing for sure. for TV and and, and writing cool. movies and eventually directing movies. Um, it's it's just a passion. Um, we've got we've also got you know a, a couple other things like maybe a comic book store, you know, That'd be that cool. you know, not not only would we have other other comic books like any other regular comic book store, but we'd be able to to put you know an emphasis on think alike uh, properties and introduce those to, to people who've never heard of it before. Right. Um, and yeah, I mean, just continue writing. Writing is writing is the end game. It's just yeah. to, to keep writing, and keep ben, creating. you as well? Um, my end game, I think, for the agency specifically, like he said, is to get our story out there and something that did start off as the flagship, really see that come to fruition and see people coast to coast you know, internationally even, because we do have international fans on Comixology through the digital website, they're able to access it, you know, outside of the U.S. And the feedback that we get, I would love to see the agency on the silver screen, you know, That'd in a movie. Cool. I can see it on TV, and I watch all these great comic book shows and properties like Arrow and Daredevil, and I just sit there and think, you know, I used to have a picture right, right on top of my desk that says, what would J.K. Rowling do? Because for me as a woman, as an author, sure. I look at her and I'm like, you know, if somebody can really put their mind to something and create the be arguably the best literary character of his, if the 21st century, not, you know, maybe even the 20th century with Harry Potter and have that kind of massive success to be able to do something like that for the United States because she's a Brit True. and that's an English property. And to be the Harry Potter of the USA, that's my end game. Like I would like to be the next big meaningful thing that America produces, you know, go team USA. Yeah, that's awesome. And and also, of course, all of our other properties bring them to light with us, but my heart lies with my flagship with the baby that started it because five, you know, 5 years ago now, we were all in an apartment together roommates before Ruben and I got married and the three of us were sitting there like over dirty dishes. This came to, to be our Think Alike Productions umbrella now, five years later, where we've got all these titles. It's beautiful. I think it's great. End game is the bi is the big time is the it's end game on the screen. That's the big cool. time. Yeah, I can see this as like a heroes sort of thing. Absolutely. But cooler and not bad in a second season. <laughs> and not canceled. So yeah. yeah, that would be great. Right. Absolutely. No, that's really cool. How about you, Roger? My end game for the agency would be the silver screen and a red carpet premiere. Yeah. Personally, I would like to adapt it into a manga, enter into an anime, because I love be that. Cool. Big anime fan? Yes. And um, at the end of the day, I would like to be retired in my comic book store. Yeah? Just live this life, cons and comic book stores and comic books. Oh, that'd be the, the best. That'd yeah, be the that's, best. That's, that's my life goal. Retire in my comic book store, old, 
reading Green Lantern 3000. <laughs> That's so, my... So what, on the anime vein, what's your favorite anime right now? Are you right actively now, watching? Currently watching, I would have to say a Dungeon Girl. Or not... Is it wrong to pick up a girl in a dungeon? Are you asking me, or that's the title? No, that's the that's the title. <laughs> oh, okay. I know it's a little long. <laughs> nice. But yeah, that's my favorite. It gives you the feels. No, I would pick up two if I could. I mean, if they're down. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'll that's level fair. up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about all time? All time? It's your all time favorite. It's it would have to one. be obviously between Dragon Ball Z and because I I read the end of the manga Naruto. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cool. You know they're making more Dragon Ball Z. Of course. Yeah. Of course. How do you and feel I'm, about I'm it? ready. Yeah, I'm you ready for it. Yes. Did you see the last movie? How'd the Resurrection with the Freezer or the with the Gods one? Yes. Yeah. Yes. What did you think of it? That was good. Cool. I mean, they, I haven't seen Dragon Ball in a long time. Right. And Goku's voice always kind of bugged me a little bit because it was so high pitched and he's right. such, a, <laughs> such a strong guy. Right. He's like Mike Tyson of Japan. <laughs> Minus the list. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was it was awesome. Beerus and Wiz Wiz was his name. The other god. Yeah. You yeah. Know, Bills. Yeah. Bills. Bills? That's purple Wiz, cat. Beers, one of the two. Which one's the purple cat? Beers. Okay, that you sure one. You saw this movie? Yes, <laughs> I, saw, I saw it with your computer. Thank awesome. you very much. <laughs> he he got it for me. Gotcha. Now, you still watch Naruto? Yes. Shippuden or Naruto? Shippuden. I, Naruto, I stopped when, the, when all the fillers started. That, I was the exact same. I was like, the fillers just got me way yeah, out I was, like, I was like, I don't need to see him get ice cream. Like, yeah. the Hokage is <laughs> at war. What's going yeah. on? I've yeah. heard Shippuden's cool. It's really it is. cool. You it's haven't like, watched any of it? I haven't. I think I watched the first episode. I was like, this is really cool, and then I just didn't watch it. Well, you're behind about 400 episodes. That's so what I've heard. if you want to catch up, you're a little behind. Yeah, I got a lot of time. Yes. That was like um, Full Metal Alchemist. I haven't watched any it's of those. It's so good, but apparently Brotherhood is even better. And I've it's heard that. essentially the same sort of trope, I guess. I'm figuring it out. Figuring it out. You watch Naruto, I'll watch Brotherhood. There you go. And we'll talk we'll about it. We'll figure it out. Yeah. You know? You seen Daredevil? Yes. What do you think of it? Fisk is probably my favorite Marvel villain. I can agree with that. Fisk is really good. So eerie. Yeah, right? Yeah. Right? I, um, I was watching it with my girlfriend, and she, <laughs> by, like, I want to say episode, maybe the last two or three, she's like, can't, like, Matt Murdock be happy here, and then Wilson Fisk be happy here? Yes. <laughs> she likes both of them. I was like, it doesn't really work that way. No. <laughs> like, I mean, arguably, they both want the same thing. They just want a better Hell's Kitchen. They're just going very different ways about yes. it. <laughs> I know Bethany was definitely Team Vanessa and Fisk. She yeah. was, uh, she <laughs> was so rooting sweet. for them to the point where I was like getting annoyed. I'm like, he's a bad guy. Right. Like, stop it. Do you like, see what he does with car doors? Yeah. <laughs> did, did you see what he did? Yeah. Right. Like, that was geez. for interrupting a dinner date. <laughs> yeah. And he keeps that poor, you know, like simpleton creating his suits, you know, like right. in the garage. <laughs> like, this is not a nice guy, no. you know. And you know he doesn't even know how to hold a wine glass. Did you see him? Right. Like that was like that's what I pointed out to to my wife. I was like I was like he's trying so hard to be like like this fancy person like this upper echelon type of person but like he gropes at a wine glass as opposed to like grabbing it by the stem and it was really <laughs> cool to like see that kind of like play between him and vanessa oh, like right. the light and the dark like she was always in she was always in in white and he was always in dark and black clothes. yeah and true. it was very very and then that final scene where he's all in white yeah. staring at that jail Hardcore, wall Hardcore man it was like and he is i, I have to agree with roger to by far i mean i loved ronan yeah, Guardians. Was fantastic. He was, you know, really creepy. But, but Wilson Fisk, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio. I mean, hats off. I mean, he was I, fantastic. I would love to see him try, kind of transfer from, the, you know, Daredevil into like the the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And right. hopefully, now that we've got a new Spider-Man, yeah. maybe that'll happen. Maybe did that'll you, uh, happen. Did you hear they're making more of the Defenders? Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I heard, and I'm everybody? looking forward to Jessica Jones. Like, Jessica I really Jones am. Jessica Jones would be cool. I really am, and I can't wait to see who they finally cast as as Iron Fist. That's, That's what I want. That's as, what I'm most excited. As for. long as it's not, uh, what, what's Ryan what? Right? No, I mean, I could deal with Ryan <laughs> Phillippe. I heard he was a real black belt. But what's your uh, your boy crush? What's his name? Uh, Roy Harper. No, um, no, not Colin Haynes. Colin Haynes is cool in my book. What uh, other boy crush? I have the, so many. The <laughs> one from from Grown Ups or uh, the the movie with uh, with Seth Rogen. Oh, Zach Efron. You want Zach Efron to be Iron Fist? I know, I don't. I, he, I just know that he's referring to Zach Efron. Yeah, but there was. Zach Efron. Yeah. Zach Efron. Yeah, High no, she can't musicals. get enough of him. Zach Efron. Um, Beautiful. Yeah, no. <laughs> but I heard that, that Marvel was eyeing him for a property, so I'm like, if he ends up as Iron Fist, I mean, I'm going to sit through it because it's Marvel and I trust right. him, but I just can't buy him as Iron Fist. I'm with you. I'm yeah. with you. He's, he's, uh, 
Yeah, I don't see that. I don't see that. Well, I mean, did you see Neighbors? Yeah. It was just funny when he was like, you look like something that like a gay laboratory whipped up. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, he's a meaty dude, yeah. but I don't see him as a martial artist. No. No, and even like Ryan Phillippe, like I heard, you know, we did, I, I did some checking and read some articles and he's he's a black belt in real life. So like That'd be Taekwondo. Cool. So, I mean, I, I'd rather deal with him. I think he's a little bit more seasoned of an actor. That'd be cool. Or That'd just cool. cast an unknown and surprise us. That's what I like. I like unknowns. Like you get someone that, I mean, Star Wars. You yeah. know, uh, Harrison Ford did American Graffiti before, but other than that, nothing. Yeah. Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, nothing. Yeah. And now they're working on set as a carpenter yeah. and was asked to read with right? Carrie Fisher, like on a whim. Thank God, because if now we would have had John Travolta, Han Solo, and uh, that would have been really bad. Or, you know, um, uh, Robert England also auditioned for Jesus. Han Solo. <laughs> wow. No joke. It was actually Robert England who told Mark Hamill to go try out for the movie. That's hilarious. And then Mark Hamill ended up getting the part of Luke Skywalker and Harrison Ford got Thank Han Solo. God. Yeah, really. Could you imagine the memes now? Oh, man. That moment you realize Han Solo and Freddy were your dreams the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> your dreams of Han Solo, like, end with him shooting you first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be insane. So, because I'm ADD and I bounce all over the place. Right. Comics, you need a story first. Yeah. And then to make it a comic, you need to have your pitch and you need to have something to show a person. Yeah. Art, colorist, how do you get it printed um, for people who are wondering? I'll let my wife tell you because she handles all the logistics. <laughs> the workhorse behind the comic. So, yeah, pretty much. Um, so the printing, I you can either ask another creator. Like I said, that's a huge um, tool, a okay. huge resource is to ask somebody who's done it, which we met a lot of people at conventions oh, who cool. had who are further in the, along in the process than we were. How did you get a printer? And the printer that we use for single issues that's domestic prints faster. Somebody referred to us their rink printing, like a roller rink printing. Right. And, um, you know, there's a lot of affordable domestic printers, but it is more costly to print domestically. So if you want to print overseas, you can use a company that we use called Kraken, like the sea creature okay. printing. And that takes much longer because they're shipping from, you know, Taiwan or China, so it's eight weeks. But how do you find a printer? Google it. Google is your friend. Ask right. a con mate that you met. Who did you print with? Um, if you have distribution through Diamond or, you know, anybody like that that works a lot with comic books, they will recommend printers you can use. It all depends on the time that you need something back by. If you have an upcoming convention and you need it within a couple of days, look for a local printer that's going to be able to print a smaller quantity fast. But if you need something bigger for a long-term con and you have a couple months, try to do it overseas because you'll save yourself a ton. Gotcha. Now, I don't know a whole lot about how the comic works. I've heard the name Diamond. That's distribution. How do you get your comic distributed once you have a comic? Um, I think, well, if you're looking to be distributed, like especially in the indie market, uh, Marvel and DC do not take submissions. Of course. Um, so they're, they're pretty much locked down. But, I mean, other places like uh, Image, IDW, I think Dark Horse, Boom Studios, those people, Top Cow, those people, they, they, um, they, they take submissions. Um, you can go onto their web pages. Uh, and then if not, you can look for independent publishers like Think Alike Productions uh, okay. or others that are out there that are probably looking to beef up their, their, their library and, and, and bring in other creators. Um, I know we were on another uh, publishing, uh, another, uh, another indie publisher when we first started out, okay. uh, and then we, we decided to leave and kind of do our own thing. Right. Um, and that's how, you know, Think Alike Productions was made. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, Facebook, Facebook is amazing when it comes to the independent comic book community. There's a lot of people out there doing it. A lot of people promoting their stuff through Facebook. Um, Diamond Distribution is really like once you're on a publisher uh, or if you can contact them yourself, uh, you submit to them and they have their own vetting process. They take it to a board, they, they dissect your comic book and it has to meet a certain standard. And if it meets that standard, well then you're put in the in the previews magazine, so to speak. Oh, okay. And that goes out nationwide to all the comic book stores. And if you can call them, the, the comic book stores, or email them and let them know, hey, my, my book is in this, this, this month's previews. Uh, please take a look at it, maybe order a few copies. That gets you into the stores, so on, you know, so gotcha. on and so forth. That's really cool. Yeah. Gotcha. I didn't know that. That's very it's, a, it's a hell of a process. What's, a, what's something that someone who's going to do this should watch out for? I would say 
just read everything. Like if you're going with an independent publisher, somebody who's out there, uh, read your contracts. Uh, as always, like with anything, I think sure. that you, you need to just, you know, cross the T's and dot the I's and make sure that you're protected. Make sure that you're not signing over your intellectual property. Your IP, your intellectual property is your idea. There is no reason why an independent comic book publisher should own your IP. They right. should own the right to distribute your comic book, but they shouldn't own it. They shouldn't own sure. it outright. So if somebody came to you at a con, so to speak, uh, a producer from Warner Brothers and said, hey, I want to make a comic book. Well, you're the one that's making that deal. You're the one that's getting the, the money. Now, right. if you want to turn around as a creator and do something for your publisher, that's on you, you know? Sure. Um, now, if you're working with somebody like Image, I know Image has those things in place in their contract where, you know, you're, they own a certain piece of your IP, I believe. Uh, and if not, I'm sure that if somebody does approach you for a TV or a movie, then they try to work it in. They would try to work in a deal because, again, they're a top branding publisher and they've bumped, uh, dumped tons and tons of money into promoting your comic book. So right. I'm pretty sure they try to get into that TV deal or that movie deal at some point. Oh, of course. Of course, when it comes down to money, they yeah. want the idea. And then there's the whole trope of, I've done so much for you, I should own it and people can get caught right. up in that. Gotcha. Anything you have, Bethany? Someone that uh, someone out. should watch out for who's getting into it? Um, who's, I was just going to say, haters going to hate, you know, so right. sure. got to keep no, it real. That's important. People, you know what to watch out for? Other people's opinions on your idea. Don't listen. If somebody's like, well, why did you put them in that outfit? Or why did you do this? You should do this. Um, don't go with that artist. Go with a cheaper artist. You shouldn't be spending so much money on a page rate where you can do it like this. And it's like, you're sacrifice. Listen, if you don't want to sacrifice the quality of something, uh, to save a couple of bucks, then don't, you know, because that's what you're doing. You're sacrificing the quality of something. A lot of people are going to tell you how to do something. It's just like parenting. If I could compare making a comic, it's to having a baby. <laughs> and I mean that. If somebody tells you, you should take your son here or you should put them in these diapers, you should give them this formula, it's my baby, okay? Right. I gave birth to this idea. I created it. I know it better than anybody. Why would I let somebody else tell me how to raise my child? Right. And it's the exact same thing with a comic book or any property that you create. As a writer and creator, you are putting your name behind something and your effort. It's like you, you know, unless, of course, if you have a movie studio buy your property and they want to, you know, make some changes to it here and there and make it this huge success okay you're gonna deal with those things but when you're getting off the ground running you should just stick to your guns as much as possible and and what to watch out for when you're getting started is what other people tell you that you should and shouldn't do just ignore them follow your heart man yeah there you go all right how about you roger something somebody should watch out for if they're gonna get into this what they said yeah because <laughs> she said everything right basically you can't listen to what other people tell you and if you are going to go with another publisher, you have to make sure. If you don't understand the lingo of like a law lawyer contract, you should get a lawyer. Gotcha. You know, somebody's friend, a family member, somebody that understands the lingo to read it for you. Deadlines. Yeah, right. that's watch another thing. Deadlines. deadlines. Watch out for deadlines. Deadlines. Nobody mentioned that one yet. Yeah. Watch out for deadlines. If if it's due on the first, make sure it's done by twenty eighth right. of, of that month, because you just in case. So there how, might be a little tweak you need to make something. How, how does that work with deadlines? I've heard, and I'm probably wrong, that you, get, you need X amount done. If you don't hit deadlines, you have to pay for the comics that they were going to do. Is that how it works? Well, it's not that necessarily. You're always going to pay for your own comic. Sure, sure. You know what I mean? Unless you have real distribution. Actually, no. You're always going to pay for your own comics. Um, you might not pay for printing them, but the creation of them will come out of your pocket. Oh, okay. Now, deadlines, what I mean by that is, let's say like we have several different ways that we produce our book on Comixology, a digital publishing website, an app, um, Diamond Distribution. Okay. So, for example, the quickest way I can make you understand is Comixology, if you want your book to come out the same day as Florida Supercon on the 28th. You need to understand that these people need to cut the panels and do all these all these different steps go into producing this comic so that it's digital ready. 
So gotcha. if you don't turn it in by a certain date and adhere to those deadlines for their production team, it's not going to come out on the day that you wanted to. Because there's just no and time. if Diamond says, oh, sure, it's going to come out in the March previews book and then you have to ship the product to us and it'll be out in comic book stores by May. So you say, okay, I want it out in comic book stores by May. If you don't get it to them by January, it's not going to be out by May. So there is gotcha. a whole bunch of different little things that you learn along the way. And, and by all means, I encourage anybody listening to this to take it from us and find out first before, you know, right. put the cart before the horse and find out what you're doing before you find yourself missing these critical things. And, and you're telling people, oh, my book's going to be out in May and people go to the store in May and it's not there. It's out in October. So put the horse before the cart. I'm not sure. Right. Whatevs. It's a really you know what heavy I mean? cart that the horse can't possibly Exactly. Pull. you got to push yeah. that He's cart, gotta, man. Have you ever seen a cart pu uh, horse push stuff? It's not fun. It doesn't work out. No, so that, that's interesting. So it's actually all on you then. Oh, so, absolutely. So you don't even, like, you know, if you're going to make a movie or something like that, everyone's on crew, you get stuff done, you pretty much go and do your job, and they kind of push you along. With this, you're literally doing all of it. You're if you doing everything. Time, if you if you have your own comic book that you're producing as an independent publisher, you are the writer and creator, and you are the president that's over... You're the director, as I mentioned before, sure. the director of the movie. The artist is, you know putting the picture out there you're sending that information those files to the colorist the colorist colors them sends them back to you you send them to a letter ensure that the script is perfect reread that script once the files are ready put them into the print ready specs that's another thing you need to learn different specs of the files and cmyk mode versus rgb color mode sure. in photoshop and all these things for whatever platform you're putting it out on is different for diamond it's different than comics all so once you have all these files ready, you're sending them to the publisher. You're getting your own barcode on the book. You're putting, yeah. you're printing the book. You're shipping the book. You're doing every. When you walk into a comic book store and pick up a comic book, the level of effort that has gone into that before you got there to pick it up is right. so insane that it's unbelievable it kind of takes away from the joy of me going as a matter of fact i go into comic book stores like i need to help these people and buy their books <laughs> because these poor people have gone through so much right i i think the same with movies i'm like oh man so many people speaking of that yes when we used to go to cons and i would see independent publishers at their booth i'd be like eh, it's all right now i feel like i need to buy every comic book <laughs> from every independent person I see. Like, I need to walk is. around the artist study and buy a book from everybody. Because <laughs> now I know what they're going through. Right. And I feel like we should support each other as a comic book community. Sure. That yeah. if buy my comic, I buy your comic, and we keep making comics. Yeah. You're like that brother of war. I know yeah. what you've been through. I've been through it too. Yeah, I used to like be, I used to have such a strong opinion on other stuff. Like, you know, if I saw a movie, I'm like, oh, that movie sucked. Or like if I read a comic book and I didn't like it, I'm like, oh man, that I'm not buying the next issue. But it's like now that I'm, I've become a creator and I've, and it's taken me all this time to, to create just this, I feel like so much goes into it that I can never judge anybody for any of their creations. Right. So you can like <laughs> bring me a black and white pencil, you know, like Stickman comic book, and I'm going to be like, great job, man. You know what I'm right. saying? Like, you really did. Did you put everything you had into it? Yes. Well, then, great job, you know? Uh, I just, I can't support half-assness, you know? But, oh, of course. But if you put everything behind it, yeah, it, you know, if you got like what my wife calls BM, bare minimum, you know, syndrome, right. like, then I can't help you. But if you put everything into it and that's what you got out of it well then good for you man you exactly. know good for you and, and that's why it's like nowadays i'm just like I, just like roger said i i want to go to every independent creator and take their book uh i fight not fight but i always tell bethany i'm like i'm always arguing to like hey like can i get like 20 bucks this month so i can help kickstart this project <laughs> you know and it's she's like well that's 20 bucks away from your comic books you know so i'm like all right fine right. um but yeah you know i just want to help everybody and, and and really just see them you know have their dreams come to fruition because it just takes a lot of work. So if you're doing it, good for you, you know? Yeah, it sounds like it. No, I, I, that's that's crazy. I never knew, like, how much of it was on you. It's 100%. Like, your book's not going anywhere if you don't move it. No, and not at all. Because you think, like, I mean, for someone who doesn't know, like, I've heard of Diamond. I've heard of Distribution. 
And, you know, Marvel, they have their people that write. They go into work. They put out a story. They essentially keep oiling the wheel that keeps going. Yeah. You guys are the machine in all of it. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, nobody pays us page rates. I wish. Right. You know, I wish somebody was paying me a page rate. But <laughs> um, but no, it doesn't It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. And, uh, and, and fortunately, at the same time, because it just makes you that much hungrier to, to get it out there and, and, and make it available to people. There are no lines you can't cross in, in independent in the independent community like Marvel's kind of hand, you know, they're, they're kind of handcuffed in the sense where like there has to be a story that they have to tell. And they can't, you know, they can't do something with a character or they can, but they can't really cross that line where you can't you can you can touch on certain things in the independent community that you can't touch on if you work for Marvel or DC. Right. Um, so, yeah, like, you know, Marvel just made Iceman gay. Right. Cool. But I'm sure they're not going to push that envelope too much farther. You right, know? yeah. Um, so, but in the independent world, you can do a lot of stuff with that. Yeah, you do you whatever know? you want. You can do whatever you want. So, so really, you know, to me, the indie world is the place to be. I think that uh, Todd, Todd McFarlane, the creator of Spawn, said something. It's a great time to be a creator right sure. now. You know, uh, Disney owns Marvel. So nobody else, no other movie studios are making Marvel movies. Which is good. Which is good. <laughs> and Warner Brothers owns DC comic book properties, so nobody else is making DC comic book movies. Right. So that leaves all those other movie studios looking to compete in that, in that superhero comic book market. And who do they go to? They'll go to the indies. They'll, they'll go, right. They go to the indies. They go to the little guys. Gotcha. So, so hopefully somebody will, you know, somebody will come knocking for the agency. Right. <laughs> we'll sell out to the to the corporate immediately. 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 <laughs> and we'll just go retire on an island somewhere. Yeah. Then we'll talk about how that deal went. Yeah. <laughs> like, they asked. I said yes immediately. Yes. That IP. Don't need it. <laughs> don't need it. I've got ten others. <laughs> yeah. Right. Everything. Yeah, all of it. We we <laughs> sold our soul. We sold our soul to Warner yeah, Brothers. Didn't even read the. Contract. Didn't even read the contract. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> no. That's crazy. No, that that's really cool. Like I, I mean, I already had a lot of respect because as a creator, you you've seen behind the curtain. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I I know movies, so I always equate everything to movies. And in movies, it takes tons of people to put together something. Like mm. I'm in an indie movie right now, and we've got like ten people as crew at the same time. Everyone's doing a bunch of different jobs with the actors as well, and it's a communal effort. Whereas when you're watching the movie, you're like, oh, well, there's the actor and he's doing his job. You don't think like how much work went into one shot of Birdman, no. you exactly. know what I mean? <laughs> like, and one shot of Birdman, the whole movie's yeah, one shot. You like know? I but know a lot of people gripe on it, but I thought it was brilliant to shoot a movie like yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. and you talk about being on in an independent movie set. How important is the gaffer? Like right, you know, like you can't do anything without that guy. Nothing. Because if not, you'll be tripping all over the place, or you don't know where your mark is. Uh, I've been able to uh, be on independent movie, you know. Sure. movie sets and it's a lot of fun i mean that's that's my next like i said that's my next goal is is uh is writing and directing i that that's where not where i really want to be because i love the comic book medium but it's just eventually where i want exactly. it's just another creative outlet You're right i'm the same i like just so much creative energy you need to plug it in somewhere right uh, i've got costuming i have a podcast now i'm in a movie like right. i'm the exact same way you're everywhere. Yeah, I can't help it. Hey. I, can't, I can't sit still. <laughs> we love you. Right? I'm sure the rest of the world will love you too. Uh, that's a stretch. The world's <laughs> really big. But, um, yeah, so we're at, oh, we're actually doing about 50 minutes. It's about, right. it's about where we wanted to be. Okay. But, uh, yes, any last things you wanted to say about anything to anyone? First podcast, maybe? Is this your first podcast? Have yeah. you been on a podcast? No, actually, we're we're not. This is. We're not <laughs> popping our cherry on uh, on the podcast. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not we gonna are, post it We're now. very experienced <laughs> podcasters. What's that like? <laughs> um, <laughs> How'd I do? <laughs> <laughs> you did. You did great. It was fun. This is actually. You know what? I will say this. This is our first live podcast, like face to face. That's right. Uh, That's everything right. else. I just did a podcast with somebody in Australia. That's which was cool. It was crazy because I usually do podcasts at night because everybody's here in America, you know, and like everybody gets home from work and it's usually like at nine or 10 o'clock at night. Right. And then like, I'm like jazzed the whole night and I can't sleep. <laughs> well, the Australian guy was like, Hey mate, can I call you like around eight thirty in the morning your time? And I'm like, Jesus Christ, seriously? <laughs> so I had to like wake up early. Yeah, I'm a writer. I'm not getting up. You know, right? like, uh, I'm not getting up early. I'm not. Who, who am I kidding? I'm not lying to anybody. <laughs> but but yeah, I woke up, did the podcast like at eight o'clock in the morning, and it was used that energy for the rest of the day. Like I think I got a lot done that day. There you go. Because I was so hyped off the, the off the podcast. But no, this was this was very enjoyable. I like I like this. This kind of like. This is the way I would want to do it. Like right? I, th this yeah. is the way that I would want to do it from now on. But 
it's hard. It's tough to get everybody in the same it space is. in the same room. Very much so. I, I like it better in person because you can actually like connect with people. Whereas on the phone, there's always that delay and you don't know if someone is like looking the way that they're sounding. You know what I mean? So you don't know how much you can get away with. <laughs> yeah, obviously it's my favorite podcast because you're my favorite cosplayer. Well, I mean, I'm partial to Jedi Brian. I don't even <laughs> refer to him as Brian. He's just Jedi Brian to it's me. It's true. So or cabbages, or cabbages, that's true. I called yeah. you cabbages My for probably the cabbages. first year <laughs> yeah. that I saw cabbages, which it's are true. still. I mean, it is still happens. to all you other cabbage merchants. I'm watching you. <laughs> Stay away from that cosplay. <laughs> that's not true. Cosplay whatever you want. <laughs> Roger, any last parting thoughts? I am Groot. Horror, horror, horror. I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> Well, then I guess um, good luck with the agency. Where can we find the agency? You can find the agency right now. Issues 1 through 5 are on comicsology.com. Okay. Like I said, it is a digital website. Um, for I'm sorry, it's a website for digital comics, and they also have an app. So you can download the app on any smartphone device, cool. search the agency, or search Think Alike Productions, and you'll see all of our titles that are currently on Comixology, Salvagers, Pray for Angels, Max Hunter, and, of course, the agency comic books. Cool. So we do have a library out there, and we also, you can go into any comic book store nationwide and ask if it's not available on the shelves right then ask your retailer to order issue one and two of the agency um, through the diamond catalog through the previous catalog and our trade paperback will be debuting in com comic book stores nationwide in October 2015 you can also visit our website thinkalikeproductions.com cool. you'll find links where to buy the agency and all the rest of our titles online and you can find more information on the agency comic book itself on the agencycomicbook.com. We've got history of the I Am, a little bit more backstory going on to the characters, the villains, so that's another cool website to visit. Sweet. And for all the social media buffs, where you can follow us uh, on Twitter, at ThinkAlikePro, and Instagram, at ThinkAlikeProductions, and Facebook is www, well, nobody says that, but facebook.com slash the agency comic book. Sweet. And yeah. how about your personal stuffs? Uh, you can follow. You can follow me unless Twitter. you're uh, an attractive young lady, because then if not, you're gonna have to deal with my wife. But uh, <laughs> you can follow me at Random Jedi Solo. Uh, she is Jedi Gypsy. I like it. And Raj is Roger is Raj. That's R O G. The Dodge D O G. What is it? D O D G E. I don't know how to spell. I'm sorry. Raj <laughs> the Dodge Zero Two. And those are our personal accounts. You can reach out to us if you're a creator. Uh, we invite you to ask a question. If you have an awesome book that you want a publisher for, we're always looking to boost up our, our library and bring on hungry creators. So, yeah, come find us. Come follow us. Take, uh, take part in our shenanigans. Sweet. I like shenanigans. Well, congratulations on all of this. Thank you. I love the agency. Hurry up with the next one. I'm, we're trying. It's you have any ideas? I've for, ran out. I got a bunch. <laughs> That's not true. I actually don't have any. <laughs> I'll be like, let's give him wings. <laughs> he Once can you teleport. carry around a toaster. Right. <laughs> Nemo has a car <laughs> that talks. <laughs> Wait a second. This sounds familiar. Uh, All right. So we're signing off? That's it. All right. Uh, thank you. Live from Florida Supercon. Yeah, Supercon. The agency. Thank, thank like. you. Yeah. Say bye, Raj. Goodbye. <laughs> All right. Bye.